Hello learners, I uh, hope the studying for geography is going well and we're actually getting closer to the A symbol. Uh, today we're actually going to look at uh, climate and weather and also fluvial processes and how it is actually tested in map work. Okay, now just a few pointers before we start looking at uh, the work itself. In this section, we'll actually integrate theory and map work, and we will look specifically at how climate and weather and fluvial processes actually can be tested in map work. Okay? Uh, it's, please, it's an important point to note that you will get tested on these sections in map work. When studying theory, learners need to incorporate the relevant map work sections at the same time and not study them separately. A very important point because learners seem to, to study map work separately and theory separately. Whenever there's a section where you can incorporate map work, you make sure you do it at the same time. Uh, I've got another important point here. Proper knowledge of theory is needed when answering these sections in map work. This is the reason why both papers are written on one day. All right, I know many learners complain that they're writing two papers on one day, but it's actually related. Okay, what we'll do is we'll start first looking at climate and weather and how we can test that in map work. I will briefly go over the theory. I'm not going to go in detail as we've done that in the sessions before. Okay. Let's start looking at some of the different sections that can be tested in map work. I'll look at the theory first and then we look at possible questions and relate it to map work. Okay, the first one that can be tested is anabatic winds. Now, you've already done this in the previous sessions where we spoke about anabatic or mountain and valley winds. Anabatic winds is when the air is heated along the slopes and it rises. So it's upslope movement of air from the valley going up the slope. Okay? We've also picked up that this happens during the day, as we did in our previous sessions, during the day. So it's upslope movement. Okay? Then we also covered in the past catabatic winds, where we said it happens during the night. When the air is cooled and the air moves down the slopes. So it's a downward movement. It's mountain winds, catabatic winds. Uh, that's one of the sections that we could look at where we will be tested on. Then another one is aspect of slope. Now here we've already learned in our previous sections that in the southern hemisphere the north facing slopes receive more sunlight and in the northern hemisphere the south facing slopes receive more sunlight. Like in this diagram, this is the northerly direction. So the slopes on this side receive more sunlight. Obviously this would be south, so these are the south-facing slopes, and this obviously the north, so this would receive less sunlight. And we also would have picked up that in most of activities, human activities, will happen on the north-facing slopes, such as farming, etc., because of the sunlight factor down there, whereas less activity would happen on the south-facing slopes in the southern hemisphere. Obviously, it will be the opposite for the Northern Hemisphere. This is another section that we look at when testing. I know I've given you quite a busy diagram here, but I wanted to give you the same diagram that I used in the previous sessions. Also, another section that we could look at is ocean currents. Now, you would have already learned that two major ocean currents affect Southern Africa. On the west coast, the cold Benguela current, which is coming from the poles, actually brings in cold, dry air uh, around this region. Okay, so limited rainfall, uh, 
colder temperatures, more mist, fog during the course of the year. And on the other side, we have the warm Mozambique current, which is coming from the equator, which brings warm, moist air. And the influence that it will have in this region is that it will increase temperatures, it will bring in more moisture, therefore more precipitation, etc. Okay, so this is another little one that we would look at and how we relate it to map work. Okay, another one that we could look at is land and sea breezes. And here also I use the same diagrams that we used in the past where we look at land breeze. Okay, here the air moves from the land to the, uh, to the sea. Okay, from the land to the sea. Okay, and as it goes in, it rises, it cools, and then it sinks. Okay, compared to the sea breeze, where the air moves from the sea to the land, and as it moves to the land, it rises, cools, and then sinks again. And remember when we spoke about this, we said that land breeze will occur during the night, because the land cools down rapidly, creating a high pressure in relation to the ocean, which cools slowly and has a low pressure. Therefore, air will move from high pressure to low pressure. And the sea breeze happens during the day, <coughs> where the land heats up faster. Therefore, we'll have a low pressure. And over the sea, the water heats up slower, so in relation to the land, it has a higher pressure. Therefore, the air will move from sea to land. So that was your land and sea breeze. Another section that we would be, could test you on, it very rarely has come up, but we never know. We could also get this question down here, is heat islands. And you would have studied heat islands already, noting that the city, if you're looking at urban, urban heat islands, has a higher temperature than the surrounding areas, especially the rural areas. Okay, you've already picked up there would be various factors such as the city's activities, okay, where with the city, the activities itself, which we could look at. Uh, industries, we could also look at uh, businesses operating with uh, air conditioners and heaters, uh, whatever, the amount of cars and people giving off heat in the city. The city structure is built of concrete and tar, which contains a lot of heat. Also, the city itself has less vegetation. Okay, because vegetation uses up a lot of heat for photosynthesis, etc. There's many factors here in terms of the water actually available in the urban area is less because of the stormwater pipes that remove the water very quickly. Okay, stormwater pipes that remove water very quickly. So there's various factors that you would have studied in theory that tells you that the city is warmer than the rural area. Okay, that's an urban heat island or a heat island generally would be an area of higher temperature surrounded by an area of lower temperature. Okay, so these are quite a few factors from climate and weather that we could test on. Let's look at some of these factors itself and see how we could test them on a map. Okay, let's look at question one. The question states, is area Z a valley or a spur? Give a reason for your answer. Now, I will come across 
valley and spur gain under fluvial processes, and I'll go in a little more detail down there. Okay? But let's look at this area here. Okay? In this area here. We look at this area, actually it's supposed to be pointing to this area. We can see a river flowing through the area here. So we know that this is a valley because there's a river flowing in there. There's various other reasons, which I'm not going to touch on now. I will touch on in the next section on fluvial processes. Okay? So obviously it's a valley. So that would be two marks. Give a reason for your answer. There is a river flowing through this area, all right? Uh, with the other answers about the V-shaped contour lines pointing towards increasing height, that's another characteristic of looking for a valley. When we look here, you will find that if you read through the map properly, this is actually an extract, so it's not very clear to see the contour lines, that these contour lines are pointing towards increasing height. So therefore, it is a valley. All right? For this one, it says, give a reason for your answer. Here, it'll be 2 times 2 equals to 4 marks. So you would give valley, and then you would give one of the reasons, which would give you 4 marks. All right? And now I'll show you a little more where we could include climate. All right? So the next question with the aid of a diagram, explain the type of wind that this area will experience at night. Now, this is quite a full theory question. But you ha here, we're just making you make reference to the map, and we can test you. So it's a whole chunk of the theory explaining this type of wind comes straight through into the map work question. Obviously, you have already learned in theory. You've identified that is a valley. Now, the next thing is that which of those winds happen during the night? Obviously, it's catabatic winds. And again, it says with the aid of a diagram, all right? So this would be two marks. And then the diagram you would draw, of course, yours would be sim simple. You're not so artistic like me to draw it so colorful. You just have to draw a simple diagram. Another little tip also, diagrams in exams should be simple and neat. You don't have to get very colorful with it. You spend a lot of time. You don't complete your papers. Okay, so I do the diagram here. Okay, and of course, you can see the downward flow on your diagram. So that is correct. I would give two marks for that. And then, of course, I would give the explanation. At night, the small air masses in the upper part of the valley cools down quickly. It becomes dense and heavy and it drains down the valley, forming catabatic flow. As long as you've got your explanation of how the reason why the air flows down the slope, it's fine. So in a question like this, I'm actually being a bit generous here, I would give four marks for this, quickly explaining the downward flow and, and how it happens actually. So generally, I would actually give... 4 times 2, which is equal to 8 marks. Sometimes it could come out for 6 marks, where we would give 2 for that, 2 for that, and 2 for a simple explanation. Okay, let's look at another question. With the aid of a diagram, explain the type of wind that this area will experience during the day. Obviously, it's the opposite, same thing, but the opposite now during the day. Firstly, I will explain anabatic winds, and then I'll draw my diagram showing me upslope flow during the day. Okay, and I will give my explanation. I'd give two marks for that. During the day, because of aspect of slope, the valley sides heat up more quickly than the floor. A pressure gradient exists between the higher pressure caused by the cooler air in the valley bottom and lower pressure caused by the warmer air in the valley side. This causes the air to move upslope. Generally, I would give two marks all right, for that, and two marks for telling me that it moves upslope. So I would generally give four times two, 
which is equal to eight marks. All right? As I say, you could get this for six marks and ask you just briefly explain it. Okay? Let's look at the next question. Explain the concept aspect of slope. Notice again, theory. Refers to the direction towards which the slope faces. Now remember we said direction, whether it's north or south facing slopes. Okay, and we've already been through a theory that north facing slopes in the southern hemisphere experience more sunlight. South facing slopes in the northern hemisphere experience more sunlight. We're getting southern hemisphere maps. So we know that our north facing slope will receive more sunlight. Okay, let's look at the next question. Again, I'm trying to use a theory in here. I know this one has, I, in my knowledge, in my years, heat islands have never come out on the map. But I've just put it in that to show you that, that you can actually even test concepts like heat island on a map itself. And it may come out in the future. You never know. Okay? Explain the concept heat island. That's simple. You know it. Area of high temperature surrounded by an area of lower temperature. This is generally a concept. So it's 1 times 2 is 2 marks. Let's look at another question. I've taken a little abstract. Most of these maps your teachers will have because these are past papers. So if you want to look at the full map, please consult with your school or teachers. They should have copies of these maps. I brought in ocean currents here. Name the ocean current found in this area. Now, the topographic map won't have the current written on it, but we could use hints and tips from the map itself. The biggest tip in this one is that this is the map of Humansdorp. Some of you have worked up on which coast it is. But you don't have to worry about that. The word Indian Ocean. And you know that the more Mozambique current flows along the east coast where the Indian Ocean is. So that little tip tells you it's already the Mozambique current. Okay? Let's look at another question. State the effect that ocean current, that this ocean current will have on the temperature and precipitation in area M. Simple theory again you learned. The warm Mozambique current actually is also warm and moist and it, it increases the temperature. It brings in moisture, therefore more rainfall. So you've learned that on the theory and simply your theory. It will increase rainfall and temperatures. In a question like this, 2 times 2 is four marks. Simple. Just that, as I mentioned to you earlier on, it's taking, when you're studying your theory, study your map work together. Otherwise, you're going to have problems integrating the two uh, sections. Let's look at another question, map on humans dot. All right? Now, I brought in another thing here, the breezes. Okay? State the type of breezes area M will experience during the day and night, area M, which is along the coast. Obviously, what I'm talking about, there's sea and there's land. I've taken the land and sea breezes, okay, and I've put it into a map work section, okay? So it's basically the same thing. During the day, obviously, it'll be the sea breeze. You've, under, you've already understood that. I've explained it earlier on. And during the night, the land breeze, straight theory, okay? That will give me two times two, four marks, okay? So quite a bit of your climate, etc., can be tested in your uh, map work as such. Now, we've covered quite a few sections in that map work and theory. All right, what we look at next is we're going to look at how fluvial processes can be tested also in map work. Now, generally there's more fluvial processes being tested and almost every paper has some sort of fluvial processes being tested in the paper itself. Let's look at 
possible sections that could be tested in the map work section. First again I'll go through the theory and then I'll look at the questions itself that could be tested. One of the ones that could come out is your profiles. All right. Now you've looked at longitudinal profile and you've also looked at it being graded and ungraded. Okay, this is just a simple diagram showing you a longitudinal profile. I'll come to that a bit later. I just want to uh, show you again or just revise quickly over a graded and ungraded profile. Okay, remember, I just get my pen working. With a graded profile, it's a smooth concave profile as you've done in fluvial processes or studied in fluvial processes. Then an ungraded profile is a profile with obstructions. Okay, there could be a waterfall. Okay, it could be rapids. It could be lakes. Okay, there could be various temporary base levels that would be found here. Okay, along this, this is an ungraded, it's not a smooth profile. And of course, in the end, you got your permanent base level, which is the sea itself. Okay, so we looked at that. Then we also looked at that the river would have various courses or various stages, all right? Where it's the upper course, all right? I like to call it the torrent stage, okay? The middle course, which I also like to call the valley stage, Okay, and then we had the lower course, which I'd like to call the plain stage. Okay, and we, we, you would have studied those three stages, and you're going to use them in map work. I'll show you just now. All right, the upper course is steep and fast-flowing river with little water but lots of erosion because it's coming down a steep slope. Okay. Then the middle course, the river starts to slow down. More water, but it's still eroding because there's still a slope. And the lower course, here we'd find the river is very slow. Much more water, the river is slow. Much more water, lots of depositing here and not much eroding. Okay, because here now the river loses energy. It's going slower, so it's starting to deposit its load. Okay. Also, you can be tested in terms of the characteristics. For instance, if we look at the upper course or the torrent stage, it's steep. So it's coming down quite steep to down, sometimes even almost vertical. So because of that, we're going to have steep V-shaped valleys. All right. What do I mean by that? If I had to draw that down here, at this area, I would draw something like that, okay? Because now we're getting more vertical erosion. It's cutting down, it's moving steep. So it's forming, starting to form that valley, okay? It's steep, okay? Also features, etc., that you could find in this one, okay? It's V-shaped valleys, interlocking spurs, waterfalls, practically... Uh, rubbing out the answers here. I'm just going to draw a little block. Okay, these are the common features that you would find in this stage of the river. And you could be tested on identifying these features on a topographic map as such. Okay, then let's look at the next section, which is the uh, valley stage or the middle course. And as we said, the river starts to slow down, more water, but it's still eroding. So what happens to the river here? 
We said it's open, gentle sloping valley with a flat plain, wider and deeper channel compared to the narrow and sh shallow channel here. So what happens here is the valley gets wider compared to the narrow steep side, yeah? Because we're still getting some vertical erosion, but we're also getting lateral erosion here because it's slowing down. So whatever material is the, uh, being eroded here also is found in here. It's knocking on the sides, etc., cetera, and, and widening uh, the valley itself, okay? Common features here, your meanders, your river cliffs, your slip-off slopes on your valleys, all right? Remember the cut-off slope, the slip-off slope, etc. you're finding with your meanders. So these are common features found in this stage itself. Then the last one, how would your valley actually look here? Here it will be not much erosion. River will flow slowly. There will be a lot of deposition. So even if you look at the movement or even the limited erosion that we would have here, first of all, the valley will be very wide. Okay, if there's any erosion, it will be lateral erosion, widening the valley, okay, and more deposition. So when we look at this, we would look at features such as oxbow lakes, flood plains, and levies, okay? Now, all that we've looked at in terms of the slopes or the diagrams itself, these diagrams here are known as cross sections. Now, this is a nice example of a cross section. All right, there's a river flowing in, all right? You can actually see quite a bit on the cross section also. You can see the width of the river channel. You can see the depth of the water. This is the outside bend, okay, because it's steeper. Because if the river flows, let's say it's meandering. The river is flowing here, so it's eroding more here. And of course, it's depositing on that side. It's eroding here. And it's depositing here. Okay? So obviously, this slope would be steeper. So erode would be here. Deposit would be here. That would be outside. We can also look at the riverbed. So this is your cross section. You can get tested on this also. Okay? So, a few more things that you could look at. Matching the cross profiles with different stages of a river, as I've showed you down here. There's a stage, that's matching the cross profile. The middle or valley stage, that's matching the cross profile. And also the plain stage. So you should have an idea about that. You've already studied that under fluvial processes. So you know already, you can identify it, basically bring in your theory as such, okay? Also, the different types of temporary base levels you could be tested on in each stage. Let's look at that, okay? Like you, you should know that in the torrent stage or upper course, you would get V-shaped valleys, interlocking spurs, waterfalls, gorges, all right? And in the a middle stage or the valley stage, you could get meanders, river cliffs, slip-off slopes, and also in the lower course or the plain stage, you could get oxbow lakes, flood plains, levees, etc. So that's identifying. And things even like rejuvenation. Okay. Here also we can get tested on this. And later on I'll show you on a map how you could get tested on those different sections. Like you've already learned rejuvenation is in when the when the river itself gains more energy or has been energized, it's been rejuvenated. For instance, a river flowing and suddenly it flows over a steep gradient. Okay, there's the slope here and it flows over a steep gradient. What happens when it flows over a steep gradient? It has been 
rejuvenated because it's now energized and it's flowing at a faster rate. Okay? Let's look at some other fluvial uh, features, etc., or steam patterns, rather, that you can get tested on. Okay? You can get tested on the meander. Okay? I'm going to skip this at the moment. All right? A meander is actually... Sorry, I'm just going to get my pen again. A meander is a bend in the river. Okay? So, if I had to go down here, I would say a meander bend in the river. Okay? Now, can you see it? Uh, how important it is to study your fluvial processes together with your uh, map work because it's on the map. All these features exist on the map itself. You've already picked up that you would get your meander in the valley stage, all right, or in the middle course, and in the plain stage. You already know your reasons, all right. You know that this is in the plain or valley stage. You already picked up your reasons is that the gradient is much more gentle, okay? Because gradient is gentle, okay? So the river now starts to wind. As when it was steep, it was coming straight down. Now the river starts to wind as we go through. So therefore, it starts to meander. And it's very clear to see on the diagram itself. If you look around here, you hardly find any contour lines showing you a steep gradient. It's a very gentle slope. All right, so gentle slopes make the river meander. Okay? Oxbow Lakes, you would have studied that. I don't have a diagram, a diagram on Oxbow Lakes, but I could just briefly show you down here, you would have studied that uh, what happens here is same thing, the meander itself, okay, has been meandering, okay, and of course it's flowing over a gentle gradient, and all of a sudden maybe the river comes down in flood, and when it starts coming down in flood, what happens? There's more energy, the river has been rejuvenated, and the river starts to flow straight through. And when it flows straight through, it cuts through the meander. Eventually what happens? Deposition happens around these areas. Okay, and part of the meander gets separated from the total river itself. And this separated section forms a lake known as an oxbow lake. Just like the bow and arrow, the oxbow. That is where you see down here. That's where the name comes, the oxbow lake. So you can get tested on that also. Other things like braided streams. I've got a little example down here. You can see it down here. All right? And you know already with the braided streams. We've got a lot of sandbanks in the area, and you've already learned that braided streams happen more towards the plain stage when the river flows slowly. And what happens here is, maybe you could do a little sketch down here. There's my river. I'm going to emphasize one area. Okay, let's say, for instance, uh, the river flows very slowly, and the river starts depositing its load in the area and creates a sand island that's higher than the level of the river. So what does the river do? The river tries to find weak spots to flow through the sand island. So we'd have many sections of it flowing here. Maybe I could use a different color. All right, I could use green here. 
and maybe it just flows through, it cuts through weaker spots and eventually joins again. So it's like those lovely braids that you have in your hair. It's the same way the river looks down here. It's braided. Okay, it cuts to the sand islands. There's a nice example of a braided stream. Other temporary base levels that we could look at and be tested on is marshes, which are found along the river. Okay? So, in the lower cost is a lot of features that are found there. Then we could look at some of the questions that you could get for this section. Okay? Let's look at this one. At what stage is the river at D2? Okay? Uh, in D2, rather. At P in D2. Now, when we look at this area here, actually, maybe I could just take this arrow and put it in this area here. Okay? So I'd like to emphasize on this area. Okay? Now we look at it. It's coming from a spot height. It's very steep. Okay? So which stage would that represent? Can you see again your theory? That is obviously the torrent. Torrent stage. So steep area, torrent stage. I'm using my theory again down here. Okay? Let's look at another question. Draw and describe. I'm actually going to just remove this line and I'm going to put in an arrow down here. Okay, I think it's clearer. Although this is the torrent stage, there's nothing wrong with the diagram. This shows it more clearer here. Uh, draw and describe the cross profile that would be associated with the stage. So, if I had to look at this stage, and we discussed it early on, we already got our picture in our minds. All right, torrent stage or upper stage, more vertical erosion already in our head, narrow river valleys, as we learned in our theory. So if I had to draw one like this, I would look at a narrow valley. Because there I've done my work already. I've shown the narrow valley, two marks. And the cross profile is narrow with steep sides. Okay? Vertical erosion is prominent at this stage. So I've explained it. All right? Okay, draw and describe. In this case, here it will be 3 times 2, which is equal to 6 marks. Okay? The next question. Uh, refer to the map extracts. Okay, the map of Rustenburg again. State the stream, and as I say, I'll maybe show it a little better here. All right? In this area. State the stream patterns or temporary base levels that is associated with the stage. Now, in the first part, you've already identified that this is the torrent stage itself. Okay? So you've already identified that. And you know it already. Now, all that you do is your theory starts to kick in. Okay, everything related to the torrent stage that you studied in your theory. Obviously, you know already the features. Okay, waterfalls, rapids, interlocking spurs. Okay, that you've done in the first section. Okay, this is down here. Exactly the same theory that you worked out because you worked out the stage. Most probably in this case, we would ask you to identify one uh, feature itself for two marks. So anyone would actually do down here. Okay, let's take another question. Explain the concept rejuvenation. I'm actually bringing rejuvenation into map work down here. Okay, uh, rejuvenation is the increase in energy levels of a river. It's been energized. Okay, that's a concept. That would be two marks. We're guiding you, remember, in exams, we're guiding you now which section we're dealing with. Okay, so that'll be one times two is equal to two marks. Okay, let's look at another question. Okay, is 
rejuvenation occurring in block J10. Give evidence from the map. Notice we're taking rejuvenation and just putting it to the maps. So my understanding of rejuvenation and what causes it from theory will have to be applied in the map work. Now we'll have to look at any area that will cause the river to have more energy. Very clear on my map, I find a waterfall down there. And we know what a waterfall looks like. If I had to draw it on the side here, there's my air landscape, steep, and the water falls over. So obviously, if it's going over a slope, you understand, especially waterfalls forming over steep slopes, it will have more energy. It's going down slope, more energy. So I identified rejuvenation on the map itself. So yes, okay, rejuvenation is happening. There is a waterfall along the river. Notice again, theory related to map work. So two marks, two marks, and then question like this, I would give you 2 times 2 equals 4 marks. All right, let's look at the another question on this. Is the longitudinal profile of the river graded or ungraded? Give a reason for your answer. Again, we're looking at the river, and immediately you're seeing a temporary base level. And when there's a temporary base level, as we did early on, remember, when I covered that piece with you, I said a graded profile is a smooth profile. An ungraded profile is a profile with a lot of obstructions such as waterfall, etc. So it has a lot of temporary base levels. So as soon as you find even one temporary base level, such as a waterfall, you immediately know that this river is ungraded. What's the reason? There is a temporary base level along the river that is the waterfall. In a question like this, we could have it 2 times 2 equals 4 marks. 2 for saying it's ungraded and 2 for giving the reason. Okay, we'll go to a short ad break. You can just get some water quickly to refresh yourself and we'll get back to the interesting stuff. Welcome back. I hope you had a good break there. And let's get back to the interesting stuff. Okay, let's look at the next question. Uh, map of Human's Dorp. The question is, at what stage is the river? Now, again, we have to look at the map interpret. Don't just guess. All right? Look at all the information that's given to you on the map itself. Now, on this side, if you have the full copy of the map, and remember I told you, all these maps are past paper maps, so it should be available at your school. On this side, in this area is the ocean. Okay, so you know the mouth is in this area. Already you worked out the stage near the mouth is the plain stage. Also you can see the meander forming. Also you can see the sand islands and the braids around the sand islands. So it's clearly one stage, which is the plain stage itself. Let's look at the next question. Draw and describe the cross profile that is associated with this stage. And you learn that in your theory, all right? You've already picked up that it's a wide cross profile. And you already know that if there's any erosion happening, it's more lateral erosion with the load, etc. it's carrying. Because deposition is a big thing here. So it's a wide open valley. All right? So this would be two marks for this. And this uh, answer here or description here, it's a wide cross valley, uh, cross profile rather. Lateral erosion is prominent in this stage. Okay? So in this case, it'll be two, two, and the mark allocation here will be three times two is equal to six. Remember, they could just uh, ask you for drawing the sketch and also just giving one reason. In that case, you give one reason and the marks could be two times two equals four. Again, another bit of theory. Map of Humansdorf again. 
name and explain the stream pattern that is happening in this area here. Okay, can you see your knowledge again? Fluvial processes, looking at stream patterns, all right? And that would be clearly, you can see how the river is going through its braided streams, okay? And the explanation again, simply as we discussed earlier on, uh, the, the uh, river uh, flows through plain stage. Okay, I'm going to put it in short. There's gentle gradient. gradient, okay, and use of gentle gradient, deposits, material, forming, that's an R forming, Sand Island. Okay. Then River uh, Cuts Streams. Through Sand. Island uh, creating braids, okay, or your braided stream itself. I've just put in short. I think I better stick to my typing, okay. I hope you can understand my writing down here, okay. So, briefly, if I had to look at this, name and explain its braided stream, okay. And the explanation, I would generally give, uh, if you look at the river flows through there and uh, material forming the sand island, and then the next piece I would give about cutting through and forming streams. So here it will be 3 times 2 equals 6. Sometimes the examiners are gen generous. They don't ask you to name, they just say explain it, it's a braided stream. So in this case, it flows through gentle gradient and deposits material forming sand island, and you could get six marks for this explanation also. So we're using stream patterns. Again, that is a theory section where it's found in your fluvial processes. Let's look at another one. State two other stream patterns that are associated with this stage. Already, again, simply, You've identified that this is the plane stage. Your theory just simply kicks in. Okay? You've identified the braided stream. And you already know from your theory which other uh, uh, stream patterns form here. Simple. It's a meander, oxbow lake. And that. Okay? We could even look at deltas, whatever, that form in this area. And that's fine. Okay, so quite a bit already done. Let's look at another fluvial process uh, section that we could test here. All right, and that's drainage density. Okay, now I'm going to show you different densities down here. That's a low density where you find that there's very few streams found in the drainage basin. I'm just assuming that that block would be the drainage basin. Then you get a medium density where there's more streams, not too little, not too much. And then you get a high density, all right, where there's a lot of streams uh, found in the area. Then you would get an extremely high density where the whole drainage basin is covered with or the area is covered with a lot of streams. So basically, density is the amount of streams per unit area, okay? Like the amount of streams per kilometer squared, okay? Now, 
in theory, you would have learned that there is a calculation involved here, the calculation of drainage density of a drainage basin. Okay? Now, what is this? It's the total length of streams per unit area of a drainage basin. Formula, total length of stream channels in a basin. Of course, you could work that in kilometers. And the total area of the basin, which is in kilometers squared. So we should get an answer when we calculate this in kilometer kilometer squared. We should be able to say that there's so many kilometer of stream per kilometer squared. Let's look at an example like this. Okay? I just drew one here uh, very quickly. Okay? Now, if, if this sort of question hasn't come out in recent times, but if this sort of question comes out and there's a lot of uh, stream patterns in the area, Generally, we give you the total length of all the streams. We give it to you. Okay, because it's, you're going to spend a lot of time. Because what you have to do here is you have to measure each stream. And you must know the streams are not like this in straight lines. It's winding. So you have to use your little paper and measure and measure and measure. And that could take you hours. So generally, the total length of all streams in the formula is given to you. The area of the block is the one you may have, you will have to calculate for working out drainage density. So in this one, I just gave you a rough sketch here. Okay, this one, the length is 20 centimeters and the breadth is 10 centimeters. So how would I work it out? Obviously, you know the scale is 1 is to 50,000 centimeters or 1 is to 0 0.5 kilometers. It's the same unit. So how would I work it out now? I would put in my formula, which I've learned already. I know that my total length of all streams is 200 kilometers, which was given to me down here. All I had to do was calculate the area of the drainage basin. I know Length is 20, breadth is 10. So there we go. Same as your normal calculation of area on a map. Okay, I want to show my answer in kilometers. So I'm going to use a scale of 1 is to 0 0.5 kilometers. So its area is equal to length times scale times breadth times scale. As normal as we discussed calculations earlier on. Length is 20 times 0 0.5, breadth is 10 times 0 0.5, which is equal to 20 times 0 0.5 is 10 kilometers. Uh, 10 times 0 0.5 is 5 kilometers, which gives me an answer of 50 kilometers squared. I'm ready for my calculation. So I've got total length of all streams, which is 200, and I have the total area of the basin, which is 50 kilometers squared. 200 divided by 50 gives me an answer of 4. Remember, these two units are different, so it becomes kilometer, kilometer squared. How would I read this? There is four kilometers of stream per kilometer squared in that drainage basin. Obviously, the higher the number, okay, the higher that number, all right, the higher or bigger the drainage density. Okay? So the bigger the drainage density, the smaller number, obviously, the smaller the drainage density. Okay? Let's look at another one that could be tested from fluvial processes. Uh, perennial, non-perennial streams, which tells us about uh, rainfall, etc. Perennial, non-perennial. Obviously, perennial streams are streams that flow throughout the year. All right. Uh, what would we look here? Okay. In this case, you won't find many dams. 
okay, and you find more vegetation, and it's represented by solid blue lines. There's a few dams here. All right, this part is your perennial stream, solid blue lines. Not many dams, because you won't need uh, a lot of dams in the area to store water if you're getting a river that's flowing throughout the year. Okay? Let's look at non-perennial. Non-perennial streams flow during the rainy season. It's generally associated with seasonal rainfall. That means certain season, that's a rainy season, when it flows. Here you will find more dams, reservoirs, windmills, and it's represented by broken blue lines. Okay, you can see it clearly here and clearly here. And you can see the larger number of dams that are found in the area because you need to store water for the dry season as such. Okay, let's look at a question. Simple question. Differentiate between the Ceylons River and the river in block K4. Okay? Uh, the Ceylons River, solid line. Okay? The river in K4, broken blue line. Generally a blue line down there. All right? So you know already, Ceylons River, solid line. Perennial river, flows throughout the year. Uh, river here, broken blue line. Non-perennial river flows during the rainy season. So we can see it. Ceylon's River is a perennial river. River in block K4 is a non-perennial river. Okay. Uh, another question here. State, whether the wa state the water tables that the Ceylon's River and the river in block K4 intersect. Now, you would have learned this in fluvial processes that you have the wet season water table and the dry season water table. So, if I had to draw a little sketch here, okay, we have two water tables. The wet, uh, I just need to sort this out. Let me just get my pen working again. The wet season water table and we get the dry season water table. I think I really need to go through a course of writing course or whatever. All right, that's a dry season. The wet season water table receives or has water during the rainy season and the dry season water table has watered throughout the year, whether it's a rainfall or no rainfall. Okay, so that's what you learned under fluvial processes. So, when we look at this, it says, state the water tables as the Ceylon's River and River in K4 would intersect. Now, when we looked at the Ceylon's River, we noticed that it's a permanent river. That shows it has water throughout the year. Okay? So it's a permanent river. So the strong chance is that for it to have water throughout the year, it has to cut through the wet season and the dry season water table. So when we look at the river in this block, we notice it's non-perennial, meaning that it has water during a certain season. So looking at this, it's not cutting both the wet season and dry season water table, because it will have water throughout the year. It's only cutting the wet season water table. So it's a periodic river. And it's important to learn your theory like that also, because many times, many learners just learn a periodic river flows during the rainy season. A, a permanent river flows throughout the year, and they don't know why. It's also nice to relate it to the water tables itself, and it makes more sense of why rivers flow at different parts of flow throughout the year. Okay? So when we look at our answers, the Ceylon's River intersects the wet season and dry season water table. It's a perennial river. So it has water throughout the year, as I showed you down here. Okay? The river in block K4, K4 intersects the wet season water table 
it is a non-perennial river, meaning that it only intersects this water table. So this is, will be the river in K4. And this will be the Ceylon's river. Okay, because it intersects both. Okay, lots of theory again, tested it, map work, applying it to map work itself. Okay, next one is direction of river flow. Uh, when working the direction of river flow, we look at the direction in which the gradient is decreasing and we consider various factors. So one, if the gradient is decreasing in a certain direction, we'd know that the river is flowing in that direction. Also a few other pointers, contour lines, okay, which way the contour lines are decreasing, okay. In which direction of that? The next one we look at spot heights, also reading in which way the spot heights are decreasing. The next one we look at trig beacons or trigonometrical beacons, in which way that is decreasing. But there's also simpler methods. Look for these ones first. The direction in which the river is entering the dam or the dam or leaving the dam wall. Now, I will show you an example later. Let's just create something down here. I want to create a dam here, okay, in this area here. All right, and I am going to put the dam wall down here. Obviously, you know water enters into the dam and comes out of the dam wall. So if I look at the dam wall down here, I know it's flowing in a easterly, oh sorry, in a westerly direction because it has to come out down here. Okay? The V shape of it, created by the tributaries with the main stream pointing in the direction to which the river is flowing. So in cases like this, can you see the V shape down here? That's a tributary joining the main stream. That also indicates the direction in which the river is actually flowing. Okay, let's look at an example. 10.1. State the direction of the river running through uh, Duran Lachter and give a reason for your answer. So let's look at Duran Lachter down here. Okay, there's a river here. Very clearly in this example, you can see the dam wall in this area. So it tells you it's flowing in that direction. Simple with dam walls. So it's flowing more in a northerly direction. Okay? All, uh, here I've given you more precise because it takes a few bends. So it's in a north-northwest. General direction could be northerly. Okay? But we looked at the whole thing. It's north-northwest. As the dam, dam wall is in the northern section of the map. In this case, even if north was mentioned, we would give you the Answer as correct here. Two marks and two marks, which gives us two times two is equal to four marks. Another one that's tested is drainage patterns. Now, you would have discussed or learned about drainage patterns uh, in class and also in our sessions that had, we, we had earlier on. We have different types of drainage patterns. We have the dendritic a very common pattern, all right? It resembles branches of a tree, okay? And it also joins the mainstream at accurate angles, showing you the direction, okay? It actually uh, forms in uniform rock structures because it's a spread out pattern. It's evenly spread out. So the uniform resistance of the rock is important. It's not hard on one area and soft on the other area. It's uniform resistance. Okay, I've given you some examples here where it happens. High felt, upper Karoo, etc. But the main focus is on the pattern. Rectangular pattern. Okay, here the main stream has 90 degree bends. Okay, so it forms in rocks that are jointed. Okay, so if I create something like this and I have joints, 
the rubber will flow between the joints, creating 90 degree bends in the main stream itself. And you can see it clearly here, the 90 degree bends. The tributaries join at right angles. Then we have a trellis pattern, which you studied, all right? Here, the main streams are parallel to one another. Very common in areas where there is folding. So your stream flows in the valleys that are created, therefore having parallel main streams and the tributaries join at right angle. Then we have a reverse pattern, which is very unusual in terms of many cases where the river flows in one way, but the tributaries actually go in. Okay, This can be because of gradient. We hardly see this very often in the exercises itself. Okay, Then we look at a radial pattern. This actually happens in areas where there's a dome or a basin. So if I do create a dome here, okay, what will happen? The river will flow away from the dome, creating a radial pattern. If I had to create a basin, okay, the water would flow into the basin from all directions, also creating a radial pattern. So with this, we can actually have two types of patterns. Uh, radial centri fugal, where it actually flows away. Centrifugal force means away, and this will be the dome. And we could also have radial centri petal, where it flows, where centripetal force flows in which is actually that one over there. We also have other patterns which are not very common, such as your parallel pattern. Similar to a trellis, all streams flow parallel to one another. Okay, A disrupted pattern, which generally doesn't have much shape, but it's like as if a stream has been disrupted from the next, it's broken off. Okay, So we get that sort of pattern, as you would have covered in your uh, fluvial processes and landforms theory. Let's look at a question on this one. Identify the drainage pattern in block C7 and 8 and give a reason for your answer. I look at it here. We can see the branches of a tree. It gives you that same shape. We can also see the main streams, uh, the tributaries rather, joining the main stream at acute angles. So this is clearly a dendritic pattern. Okay, So the answer is dendritic. It resembles the branches of a tree. Or we could put the tributaries joining the main stream at right angles. In this one, it will be 2, 2, which is 2 times 2, 4 marks. OK, I want to now look at Another section that's common and generally is tested in map work, again, from fluvial processes and landforms, and that is the landform sites, all right? The contour lines and associated features or landforms. And I'm just going to show you a description with each one. Let's look at this, okay? If you look at a map and you see the contour lines are far apart and say describe the slope, okay? you know that that is a gentle slope. All right, always visualize. This is looking at a diagram in your theory and looking at how it will look at on the map. Okay, let's look at this one. Lines are closer together. Can you see it? Describe the slope. Remember, this is a steep slope. And this is how it will look at in your uh, theory section of your notebook. Let's look at another one. Uh, the slope here, the lines are more or less equal distance apart. Can you see it? The distance from there to there, there to there is more or less equal. Okay? So this slope will be a uniform slope. Very straight, very smooth slope. All right? 
Then we look at this one, where the lines are close, far apart, close, far apart, close, far apart, close. So it tells you steep, gentle, steep, gentle, all the way through. And that is your terrace slope. It has like terraces on it. Can you see the steep, gentle? This is the gentle, this is the gentle. This is the steep, that's the steep there. Okay? Let's look at another one. In this one, if you look at it here, it starts off gentle and then it gets steep. Okay? So look at this. Starts off gentle and then it gets steep. You can see the shape here. It's creating. It's a concave slope. All right? Let's look at this one. Starts off steep and then gets gentle. Starts off steep and then gets gentle. So this is your convex shape. So it's your convex slope. All right? Another one showing you this. Two slopes. Okay? From A to B. It's giving you a little of a longitudinal profile here. Can you see it? Here it's steep to gentle, concave. Here it's gentle to steep. This is how you'll see it on a map. Convex. All right? And here the lines are all equal distance apart. And you'll find if you look at a uh, longitudinal profile, it's actually uniform. It's a nice straight slope as such. And this is common in your uh, topographic maps where you'll have to identify. Let's look at further landforms. Undulating slope. All right. Again, it's more steep, gentle, steep, gentle. All right. Uh, going through, you'll notice the pattern there, and you'll notice how it goes here. Okay. It's a not a regular slope. All right. Other things that you've done under landforms is your butte. Okay. Let's look at how it looks on the map. Okay? Generally, your sketch is like this, where the center ring, all right, or the center contour line is small. Okay? And then you find contour lines close by, and as you go out, the contour lines uh, get further apart. Okay? Let's look at this. Here's a real example for you that you will find on a topographic map, but you will notice, okay, your layer of hard rock as you discussed in fluvial processes coming down, okay, and also you will notice that the width is actually smaller than the height, okay, but this is how it will look at on a topographic map. All right, MISA, okay. Uh, what we look at, and I want to just describe something because learners actually confuse this. I want you to just observe this piece, and I'm going to go back to the butte. And notice this contour line found in the center. It's much smaller for the butte compared to the mesa, where it's much larger. And you know the reason already, because in the butte, the height is greater than the width, so it's narrower. But in the Mesa, the width is greater than the height. So therefore, the center contour line here will be much broader. And you can see it clearly on this extract from the topographic map. There's a little photograph here, and you can see it down there. A very broad top compared to the butte itself. Okay? Another one, okay, is a valley and a spur. Okay? You know that the valley is a low-lying area there, and the spur is the high-lying area. Okay? There also on the picture, you can see the spur and the valley inside there. Here also you can see it, all right, your spur and your, or your valley and your spur. 
I've got another little diagram here showing you to identify. Okay, a very important point if you're identifying valleys and spurs. Okay, if you look at this, there's your valley here. All right, and if you look at the readings, in a valley, contour lines make a sharp V shape pointing up the valley. So the sharp arrow points to increasing height. And that's how you'll make it out if it's a valley. All right? Whereas with the spur, on the other hand, all right, the contour lines are rounded and point downhill. All right? As you can see down here, it points downhill. So in a valley, the arrowheads created point to increasing height. In a spur, it points to decreasing height. There's another little sketch here. This is how you'll see it on a topographic map. Okay? Look at another thing that you can get tested on and you deal with in, 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 the, in theory is a gorge. Very clear to see here. It's a complete opening. There's a contour lines on both sides showing you the steepness of the slopes. But here, it's a complete opening. All right? There's a nice picture of a gorge where you're going through. Okay? On a map, you can also see it. There's all your contour lines here. Okay, they're quite steep on the sides. Okay, but there's a clear opening. That's why you call it a gap or a port. Okay? Let's look at another one. This is very rarely tested because we don't get such huge maps. But I just thought uh, to appreciate uh, that we can even show you the escarpment. Okay? It's a huge piece of land. Remember, the escarpment has steep sides. And the whole of Gauteng, etc., is found on the escarpment. So this is a map with a smaller scale, but showing you as your escarpment. There's all the steep contour lines here, okay? That's found here, which creates this area. And this is a massive area covering thousands of square kilometers. Okay? Dip slope, scarp slope, or scarp slope, dip slope. You've already learned that in theory, a scarp slope refers to a steep slope and a dip slope refers to a gentle slope. When you look at the contour lines, scarp slope, because contour lines are closer together, dip slope, where it's further apart. All right? It's a gentle slope. Just remember, they say, describe the slope. This is steep, gentle. Name the slopes. This is scarp, dip. Okay? A little cross section here that shows you uh, the, the steep slope, which is a scarp slope, if the, in case you're asked to draw a cross section. And this is a dip slope, the gentle slope itself. Okay, let's look at the next feature, the cliff. I'm just going to get my pen ready here. Okay, the cliff itself, you can see an almost vertical slope. Okay. Let's look at the next one. Look at the waterfall here. Can you see how the contour lines actually form along it? Okay, making a steeper slope, creating your waterfall. Okay, we discussed that earlier when you looked at the diagram. With this one, a gorge. On the topographic map, it'll show you this way. Notice as you're nearing the valley how close the contour lines are. Okay? So this again is identifying it on a topographic map. Okay? Let's look at a watershed. There's your watershed. And this is how it look at on a topographic map. Can you see how much, by using the topographic maps, these are little sketches that are similar on a topographic map, how much you will pick up on your fluvial processes and identify them. And also make your understanding of fluvial processes much easier. Okay, and there's your river patterns flowing away from the high-lying area, which is your watershed. Okay, so very interesting of how much you actually used in your explanations. Let's look at some questions here. Identify the feature marked E on your topographic map. Okay, now when we look at this feature, okay? Again, we spot a few things here. 
We need to look at the center one. Maybe it didn't come out that clear, but it's quite big in there. Okay, it's not small. And remember, we won't get a plateau on a diagram like this. Okay, because the plateau is too big and we get tested on one town and it's surrounding rural areas. So it either is a butte or a mesa. But because the contour line in the center is quite big, okay, we know that the width is greater than the height. So obviously the answer is a mesa. Two marks. All right, let's look at the next one. In block D3 is associated with inclined or horizontal uh, strata, okay? Now, we can see a gen steep slope on one side and a gentle slope on the other side. So it gives you more or less the formation of a ridge that you understood earlier on. Remember you did Cuesta, uh, Hogsback, whatever, okay? So this could be a inclined strata that is found in that area. Okay, let's look at another question. Identify and describe slopes P and Q. So we look at the slopes here. P is close, okay, and it says identify and describe. Okay, so both, you have to name them and describe them. Okay, so Q, the contour lines are close. P, the contour lines are further apart. So P would actually be your dip slope, which is a gentle slope. Contour lines are far apart. And Q would be your scarp slope as the contour lines are closer and it is a steep slope. All right, let's look at the next question. All right, in this question, we're using our knowledge of general hiking, and we're also identifying different patterns in the area as such. So I'm looking at the question itself. You are a novice hiker, and involving you in the question, who is very unfit. I hope that you are fit and not unfit. Okay, you are given a choice between doing the hiking trail C or D. Okay. Starting at F in J8, which hiking trail would you choose? Give one reason for your answer. All right? So I'm looking at from C to D starting at F. So I look at C to D. All right? Uh, sorry, from F to D, and then I look at from F. Uh, F to C rather, and then F to D. I'll examine the contour lines. My knowledge of slopes will come into action here. And if I look at that very clearly, oh, sorry, I look at this very clearly, I will find that the slopes are much more gentle in that point. All right, due to the exaggerating of the pictures, etc., it makes this look much closer. Okay, so it's gentle here and steeper there. So my answer would be D. Okay. It has a gentler slope than C, and also in this type of diagram, it covers a shorter route. A bit of fluvial processes and landforms in the area. It's understanding the terrain in this area down here. Therefore, we choose that answer. If this is the one here, it says give one reason. I'll get two marks for this, and for one reason, two times two equals four. Okay? Let's look at another question. Here, same area. I say identify the land form at F where we will start your hike. So F in this area, I can see a stream there. Okay, so automatically and the contour lines are pointing to increasing height. It's not very clear in this area, in this map, but if you look at the map that you have in school, you'll notice it's very clear there. All right, therefore it is a valley as such okay a valley as such all right now i just want to add one more question down here okay i'm going to draw this i'm going to take this off i'm going to put spot height 1533 three down here let me add a question i want to, to find out okay there's spot height 1533 three. 
Okay? And my question reads, all right, let's put it down here. Draw, let's put it at the bottom. Okay? Draw a rough cross section from spotite 15332 D. Okay? And I will say show all slope elements. Okay? And I would make this let's say for instance six marks okay now I have a little diagram in here now when I look at this area here it's first contour lines are far apart then it gets steeper so it's forming a concave slope then it gets quite steep then the contour lines are equal distance apart or let me even move this way it's, it's uh, contour lines are far apart then it gets steeper and then obviously it gets, uh, the contour lines are equal distance apart. And as we move further, it gets further apart as we move towards D. So very clearly here, you can see four slope elements. So in this case, I've got spot height 1533. If I had to draw my rough cross section, I will show, remember it doesn't have to be accurate. I'll show the convex slope coming in from here where it gets, it's further apart and then it gets steep, so gentle to steep, okay? Then this area gets quite steep down here, so it's more vertical. Then here the contour lines are equal distance apart, as shown down here, okay? And the last piece where it's very far apart the contour line, so the slope is very gentle. And there I have my cross section on slope elements. I've labeled them. Obviously, you know the concave slope is the crest, the steep slope is the cliff, uh, the uniform slope is the talus, and the gentle slope is the pediment. Okay, so you can even get tested on slope elements, etc., in this section. Uh, learners, I hope that my sessions on map work uh, were of benefit to you and help you uh, in order to get closer to that A or, uh, well, I should be saying get closer, should be helping you to get that A that you also want. All the best, learners. Goodbye.